There are countless books, articles and studies that ask the question, why do people like horror? With answers that can routinely be summarised as the adrenaline of safe scares, a natural curiosity for the strange in its mysteries. But I'm interested in answering its more accusatory neighbour. Why do you like horror? Why do I like horror? Because for me, it has very little to do with being scared the usual basis for predominantly scientific explorations. And here's where I'm revealing my hand somewhat, because I'm speaking under the title of implied objectivity, of why horror is the best genre, and obviously the impossibility of applying such a definitive assessment to a subject as subjective as art means that this is a straight up lie. But it's a thematically relevant lie. Because the question of objectivity has perhaps never appeared more fraught than in the context of horror. Not only because horror as a genre is frequently predicated on the immaterial and the irrational, but because it occupies the interstitial, deliberately carving a space between living and dead, known and unknown, fact and fiction, designed to deliver entertainment through the things that make us cringe. And that, perhaps more than any other genre, a person's propensity towards horror is a matter of personal preference. And so, here we find ourselves in a space governed by the whims of something scarier than mere monsters. A force forever shifting in the shadows. The subjective. And I think its influence goes beyond personal exploration and gets right to the heart of the genre itself. A genre that, even outside the context of art, strives to make a mockery of objectivity. Horror immediately complicates ideas of objectivity through its fascination for the interstitial. One that's at odds with its own classification as a genre in being at odds with the very concept of classification. Genre as a structure delights in boundaries, and horror as a genre delights in transgressing boundaries. All figures in horror are built from this foundational violation. The living, dead, animate, inanimate, human, non-human, interior, exterior, large, small, familiar, unfamiliar, they resist clean categorization, dripping their horrific, unclassifiable goop just all over the place. But building on the work of anthropologist Mary Douglas on purity and danger, philosopher Noel Carroll concludes that we can speculate that an object or being is impure if it is categorically interstitial, contradictory, incomplete, or formless. And horror has made a feature of the formless. The blob, the thing, the stuff. Professor Isabel Pinedo also implicates physical violence against the body as part of this same disregard for boundaries. Dismemberment, evisceration, putrefaction, all serve to disrupt the order of the body, creating an abject horror, which philosopher Julia Kristeva defined as not only a disintegration of classification or the body, but the place where meaning collapses. Pinedo, too, comments on this complete dissolution of traditional understanding, where categories break down, boundaries blur, institutions fall into question, and, along with many other disintegrations, the stable, unified, coherent self acquires the status of fiction. And so, horror resists even the most basic of certainties. This isn't to say that horror has successfully dismantled the very notion of categorization. As theorist Ralph Cohen wrote, the notion of transgression presupposes existing genres to be transgressed, but it denies a simplicity of objective categorization and even extends this to the principal dichotomy of fact and fiction. In terms of fiction, horror is maybe the genre that has the most turbulent relationship with the truth. A once desiring connection with the real world, even with specific histories, but also to frequently drive beyond these limits. The constant tension between based on a true story and it's only a movie. And it's a tension that's mirrored in our own spectatorship. The horror movie experience is one defined by discomfort. The sense is played in such a way that generates a constant transitioning between the fiction of there and the reality of here. Visceral responses drawn from fear, horror and disgust that drag the viewer away from the imagined world to be violently flung back to their own body. And that distance between there and here is further complicated if we consider how horror is a genre that delights in its own fiction. 
not only due to its supernatural and fantastical narratives, but because horror cinema, more than any other genre, has built its conventions around a conscious cannibalization of past productions, and in doing so, deliberately draws attention to its theatrical condition, to its entirely false depictions of a subject. As writer Philip Brophy concludes, the contemporary horror film knows that you've seen it before, and it knows that you know it knows you know. You know? This leads critics like Arthur Crystal to be skeptical of genre in general, claiming genre readers simply want the comfort of a familiar voice recounting a story that they haven't quite heard before. And as much as we might talk about horror as a genre defined by more negative emotions, maybe there is something comforting in the familiarity of those narratives, if not those creatures. Because horror's affinity for repetition goes beyond literal remakes or archetypes. It's built on the ancient burial ground of our own past. The fears we've passed down, that we've inherited. Connecting us to ancient pasts and primal unease. And while the origins of these fears make sense, disease, physical threat, the unknown, the response evoked by these fictional terrors is anything but rational. Terence Rafferty, however, writing in the New York Times, also attributes this trend of remaking to the traditional shamelessness of the horror genre. It's almost hedonistic disregard for good taste or fair play. But there's a perverse kind of pleasure in something that can seem so apathetic towards public opinion or critical reception. Something that resists me. Philosopher Byung-Chul Han writes about how negativity is disappearing everywhere. Everything is being flattened out into an object of consumption. And that in this inferno of the same, erotic experience does not exist. Because erotic experience presumes the asymmetry and exteriority of the other. The atopia of the other. Maybe in a world that's increasingly optimised, there's a relief in discomfort. In something that wasn't built to be smooth or easy. Or maybe, outside of our automated routines, the world is becoming increasingly uncomfortable. And there's a relief in acknowledging it. Even inviting it. Either way, it's an experience I know I'm predisposed towards. Like, if someone's describing something gross and they say, don't look this up, it's super gross, you know I'm already on Google Images. But I can't claim that horror is an entirely atopic experience. It is still a product there for you to consume, however much it might protest that it doesn't require your consumption. Though you aren't entirely in control either, even if you have entered into this agreement. It's like the way John Paul Sartre describes slime. Only at the very moment when I believe that I possess it, behold! By a curious reversal, it possesses me. If an object which I hold in my hands is solid, I can let go when I please. Its inertia symbolises for me total power. I give it its foundation, but it does not furnish any foundation for me. Yet here is the slimy reversing the terms. I open my hands, I want to let go of the slimy, and it sticks to me. It draws me. It sucks at me. A surreptitious appropriation of the possessor by the possessed. And sure, maybe he's being a bit extra. But in these delightfully dramatic words, slime can be positioned as both a component of horror and a symbol of it. The horror narrative sucks at us, possesses us. The fear response is like your body and emotions betraying you, like you're under assault from both the physical and the intangible parts of your being. Or maybe the pleasure here comes from the genre acting not as a possession, but a battle. I'm not a victim, but a contender. A contender in a battle that is not there to be won or lost, only fought. Like novelist Clarice Lispector's description of the Sphinx, I did not decipher her, but neither did she decipher me. Struggle is generally central to any narrative, but I don't think any other genre is so committed to externalising how it feels to struggle. Especially in this current era of horror. A renaissance that mirrors that of the 1980s, though it's moved away from the slasher and back towards the supernatural. But rather than deriving discomfort from the traditional shadows of the strange, these films retain the visceral legacy of the 80s and increasingly blur the line between physical and psychological. 
It's in this way that they begin to bridge the gap between internal and external when it comes to struggle and pain. Essayist Elaine Scarry explains the usual isolation of pain that because pain can't be seen or felt outside the sufferer's own body, it may seem to have the remote character of some deep subterranean fact that has no reality because it has not yet manifested itself on the visible surface of the earth. Or, to summarise, to have great pain is to have certainty. To hear that another person has pain is to have doubt. The 80s Renaissance was all about doubt. The killer with a seemingly supernatural ability to defy death who returns relentlessly. That final scare that catches you just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. 80s horror can essentially be defined by <laughs> psych, and that doubt manifests again in psychological horror. Is the threat something supernatural or is it the product of the mind? Virginia Woolf wrote that literature does its best to maintain that its concern is with the mind that the body is a sheet of plain glass through which the soul looks straight and clear, and that, regarding pain and illness, this is partly down to the poverty of the language. But the contemporary horror film speaks a different language, one that's often undeniably bodily, and it transforms those invisible internal conditions into an adversary we can see, making the doubtful certain, but not a certainty of true objectivity, only certainty in our own subjective experience, or someone else's. And when pain is transformed into an objectified state, as Scary continues, it, or at least some of its aversiveness, is eliminated. Scary is specifically talking about physical pain, but the same process can be applied to emotional states and abstract fears. Anything that we can feel, but we can't see. Anything that we can feel, but can never fully share with another person not without that doubt. But that's another thing Scary identifies in this objectification, a newly created shareability. When something has shape, it begins to externalise, objectify and make shareable what is originally an interior and unshareable experience. As much as horror is a genre defined by the unknown and the unknowable, it's equally defined by a simple desire to be understood when we ourselves feel monstrous or alone. It connects individual and collective experience, especially in cinema since, as Isabel Pinedo points out, the movie theatre is already a semi-public setting, both communal and solitary. And I don't think any other genre evokes quite the same camaraderie in its collective viewing. It comes back to those Google image searches of weird or gross stuff, because I don't just want to look it up, I want to show it to everyone I know. And video essayist Shannon Strucci talked about this in her video Getting Breened, comparing the enjoyment of the nonsensically awful filmography of Neil Breen to deliberately tasting something disgusting, but also trying to get everyone else to taste it too. So while the focus of the video is on the appeal of the fascinatingly bizarre, of something just completely beyond reasonable comprehension, I wonder how much of this appeal is also predicated on shared experience, from collective confusion and commiseration. So, in the spirit of sharing, I asked. So, Grace asked me if the communal aspect was a key part of my enjoyment of Neil Breen's films. And despite the fact that I say in my video that having the same structured shared cultural experience that The Room and Rocky Horror have developed into would detract from my enjoyment of Breen's work, I totally agree with Grace and my answer to her question is a yes. I don't think that at any point I would want to face Neil Breen films alone. Experiences I deliberately seek out to intimidate or frighten me aren't that much less frightening when I'm with friends and like-minded people but the experiences are richer, and our discussions around what we go through together both increase my understanding of my own experience, give me new perspectives, and bluntly, are always just more fun than going at it alone. We can never really share our internal experiences. Really, even this exploration could be another demonstration of that difficulty. These effects of horror are certain to me when they may be doubtful to someone else. 
and equally applies to my love of horror itself, since the world conveyed as a vast expanse of the unknowable and the monstrous is the world that most makes sense to me. I see these fictional worlds where nothing is as it seems and everything will be what it isn't, and I'm like, yeah, that checks out. Virginia Woolf, again, said that there is a childish outspokenness in illness. Things are said, truths are blurted out, which the cautious respectability of health conceals. And so maybe we can consider horror to be the cinema of the sick. A form which allows us to petulantly and narcissistically express our subjectivity. Even in video essay format. Horror has evolved from these primordial stories that were used to explain the unknown to a tool for expressing the known but intangible. And in doing so, horror questions the dichotomy so often established as objective good, subjective bad when what we're left with isn't a matter of truth, but rather the competing discrepancies of personal experience. In attempting to extract the personal, the interstitial, the bodily, the objective is not necessarily a superior interpretation, simply another incomplete one. Just as any subjective interpretation is necessarily incomplete. But sometimes in order to understand something abstract, something like our pain, or even more so, someone else's, it's easier if it's given a form we can see. Though horror equally relies on the demonstration that just because you can't see something doesn't mean it isn't there. And so it always encourages us to reconsider what we might be missing.